Hi, uh, my name is Kevin Power. I'm going to read a short section um, from my novel, White City, which is published by Scribner UK. Um, in this part of the book, the narrator, Ben, who later ends up in rehab for drug addiction, um, is arriving in Serbia, Belgrade, to take part in a property deal, which he believes will make him rich. Coming in over Belgrade, my plane was struck by lightning. I know this sounds like bullshit, but it's true. Later, there was footage on the news. Voila, the pearl-handled Boeing banked for a descent, the grey clouds teetering in a morbid sky, and then, bam, a jagged tongue of white pink voltage licks the tip of the fuselage and the plane turns puce like someone on a very bad trip. Inside the cabin, we were braced and belted for an emergency landing. The engine made a sound like a pair of shoes turning over in a washing machine. I asked a passing stewardess, she was German and pinch-faced like Ilsa Koch, for another gin and tonic, but was informed, quite rudely, I thought, the beverage service had now been discontinued. The recirculated air took on a petroleum reek. Beyond the plastic porthole with its fringe of stratospheric ice, the grey clouds loomed and roiled. Over the PA system, the pilot hummed some reassuring lines. The lights went out. This was it. We weren't going to make it. I would never buy that cabin in the woods with its king-sized bed, its cellar stocked with Californian wines. My plan was going to fail, and, adding injury to insult, I was going to die in a plane crash. I viewed these developments with equanimity. I had taken six precautionary Valium before takeoff. We bumped down in a field 40 miles outside Belgrade. The plane deployed its inflatable slides. We were briefly children again. Whee! I tumbled earthwards and rocked my feet to find myself surrounded by army men with flat top haircuts and frowns of cold command, like extras in a film about defecting to the West. Gesturing with their Kalashnikovs, they herded us into canvas back trucks and sat beside us unsmilingly as we were driven to the terminal at Tesla. One of them dashed a cigarette from my hand when I tried to light it and screamed at me in a language that was presumably Serbian. Jesus, I said, chill. Through the canvas flaps, I glanced back at our plane. It was tilted forward alarmingly. The front landing gear had buried itself in the earth of the tilled field. Is normal, said the mustachioed middle-aged man sitting next to me. Happened when there is storm. Yeah, cool, I said. Double bagged and taped to my shaved inner thigh was a pharmacopoeia of powders and pills, benzos, uppers, sleepers, codeine, coke, weed, which had managed to pass unmolested through the security system of two major airports. Things I felt were looking up. The first tremor of doubt assailed me when I cleared arrivals. With my venture capital sigh, I took in the shabby terminal buildings, the fields, ash and grass, the empty shipping containers, stacked like broken Lego bricks at the edge of the airport dropped the wheel arches of each idling taxi had been eaten through by rust. I looked around for traces of high fructose capitalism to the neon heraldry of the market state. But the general vibe hereabouts bespoke an ongoing and tragic mismanagement of the means of production. Off in the distance, a huge white mist was swallowing the countryside field by field. I looked back into the underlit arrivals hall. Through the gloom, a lurid green no-exit sign blinked steadily off and on like bad news glimpsed in a dream. This was it, I thought. This was the new frontier of development opportunity. Then I remembered. We were taking these suckers for a ride. Mullins's plan, and therefore my plan, relied quite heavily on the desperation of our Serbian partners. And if I lived here, I told myself, I would certainly be desperate. I took out my phone, which in a secretive way had located a carrier called something like Globski Capital, and texted Mullins, I'm at airport, where are you? Fifteen minutes later, he still had not replied. Passing Serbs were beginning to look at me in a way that suggested I was being sized up for a mugging. I dialed Sean Sweeney's number and got the out-of-service message. Vaguely, I remembered an email that Mullins had sent me containing the address of our hotel. For 10 minutes, I was sobering up horribly. I scrolled through my inbox in search of it. Last, bingo, Hotel Karlovsky, followed by an incomprehensible address. Injecting some entrepreneurial brio into my stride, I went up to the nearest taxi driver, who seemed to be chewing on a mouthful of brown grass. 
I need to go here, I said in a loud, clear voice. Without looking at my phone, the driver said, name a problema, and grabbed my suitcase, 400 dinar. I don't know how much that is, I said. Is good rate, the taxi driver said. He wore a greasy cloth cap and had the hopeful corrupt look of an immigrant who might eventually make it as a bent cop in the big city. I pointed at the next driver along. Will he do cheaper? You had to negotiate. This was what Mullins had told me. The second driver looked at me and spat into the gutter. 400 dinar, the first driver said. You stay Hotel Karlovsky, I take. He also spat. The brown grass, it appeared, was some form of popular local chewing tobacco. What's your name, I asked. Asking people's names was step one in a rapport building technique that I had learned from James Mullins. Step two, share a problem. Step three, make a joke. The driver mumbled something that sounded like the word Stradivarius spoken through a mouthful of mushy peas. I shrugged. I'm going to call you Boris, I said, opening the rear door. Hope that's cool. Thank you.